Welcome back to Garbardia. It's good to see you again. If you hear any weird sounds in the background, it's because my little dog goes in here. Because someone can't be left alone or else he eats my shoes. Ain't that right? But here you go for the next part of this chapter. Hope you enjoy. The next morning came with little fanfare, but with a lot more curious accents. While the company and their guest platoon under Piper breakfasted together, Yule took stock of the current personnel numbers under his umbrella of power. He had taken all of his Veil Riders with him, numbering 66 in strength, along with four additional troopers if he included Brita, which he couldn't have left behind and had dragged her along just to reduce headache. Piper, after he and his platoon had rested, held a morning formation to do a count, and also say prayers for their fallen brothers and sisters in the field. To Piper's delight, he found that he had miscounted through all the chaos of getting here, and was happy to tell Yule that he, in fact, had 39 soldiers alive and well, making them a larger-sized platoon element than he had previously thought. Piper was also happy to see his explosives expert had survived the trip in, and quickly rounded her up to introduce her to Yule. Tatiana Moskal was almost as slight as Gremlin was, except instead of black hair, she sported a ruddy red mane that was long on the top and shaved under on the sides. In her hair was also all a manner of wire tucked away in case she needed it, and constantly smelled of explosives and ozone. When Yule shook her hand and looked into her sparkling green eyes, all he saw was the madness of someone who was touched by the raw power of the shockwave spirit, and knew full well this woman was dangerous beyond all compare. Despite the air of danger around her, she still held the pleasant diamond-shaped face that he knew a lot of Polish women sported, and her full lips were always held in a pleasant, if unnerving, smile. Nice to meet you, Corporal Moskal, Yule said, shaking her hand firmly. Corporal Moskal gripped his hand back. Do you mind if I go see what kind of ordnance you're trucking around? Moskal said with another alarming grin, and Yul flicked his eyes to his left where the makeshift ammo depot was. Uh, sure, just don't use any of it. Moskal rubbed her hands together with a gleeful giggle and trotted over to the area Yul pointed her to. Yul smelled his hand as he watched her leave and found it to smell curiously of smoke. He then looked up to Piper, who was watching him. You know she's fucking crazy, right? Piper just laughed. Oh yes, a few bats short of a bell fry. After meeting Moscow, Piper then introduced Yule to his other soldiers, the majority of whom were country Germans looking for a bit of adventure. Then came the Czechs, who came purely for answers as to why their unit was disbanded after a mission in the deserts during Enduring Freedom. The Polish y'all seemed to share the same outlook on why they came. They would be damned if they got left behind on this trip, and were keen to show the Germans how real soldiers operated. Yule couldn't help but chuckle at this, and the heckling that followed soon after as the Germans and Polish shared rude gestures and good-natured teasing. Summed up, there were 19 German here troopers, one Luftwaffe security trooper who had apparently snuck his way into the here group, Ten soldiers of the Polish Wojska Landowa, and nine Czech paratroopers from the disbanded 601st, whom had long wondered just why they had been disbanded in the first place after finding some relics while operating in Afghanistan in 2008. While the Veil Riders egged on the Poles and Germans, Yule worked his way through the boisterous crowd to where the Czechs were huddled around a small fire making tea, and saddled up to a log nearby to sit on. The Czech 601st troopers nodded towards Yule, and he checked to make sure his amulet had plenty of blood in it before cramming it back into his patrol cap and back onto his head. So, how many of you came through? A man bearing the double stars of a sergeant first class spoke up while looking down into the pot of tea, stirring it gently with a giant field spoon. Only fifteen. All we could manage to slip in. And nine remain. Yul murmured. I'll cut to the chase. What did you find in Afghanistan? The spoon scraped to a stop in the pot, and the man's eyes slowly rose up to meet Yule's. 
All of the other 601st operators look to each other with their eyes, heads unmoving, before coming back to you. We found a body, the sergeant first class murmured, and slowly spun the spoon in the pot, as well as the tail of their mission. It was March in Afghanistan, and the moon was shining bright overhead, letting plenty of light filter in through their helmet-mounted night vision to illuminate the cave system ahead. They were out here on this godforsaken mountain under the belief that the head of the insurgency in the area was hiding within, using the herd paths around the mountain and the valley to launch mortar and rocket strikes into Fob Shank. To help alleviate this madness, the 601st sent out a small strike team to cut the head from the snake. There was no resistance the entire way up, not that they expected any, as the drone hovering overhead didn't report anything in their way. With the flick of a toggle, their pecs shot out their lasers and lit the cave mouth up with light, and they moved into the inky black snuffed out one by one from the gaze of the moon. Gravel and sand crunched under their feet like snow as they silently wound their way down the tunnel. Their first contact was a man asleep where he sat, his RPK resting across his lap as his head lolled on the back of his ramshackle steel chair. One of the 601st slid out his knife, the metal hissing on the nylon scabbard, before bringing it down with both hands into the eye socket of the man and punching through the skull into the brain. The ruffle of fabric, a squelch of flesh, and the crunch of a spine breaking on the back of the metal chair were the only sounds to entertain the walls of the cave. The knife-bearing operator ripped the knife out, and then buried it into the neck and armpit of the dead sentry for good measure, before wiping the blade clean on the dead man's shirt and slipping it back into the scabbard. The sergeant first class looked down at the lantern that burned down to the wick and smiled. If the insurgent had been a little more disciplined, there would have been light in here, and he may have been able to see their faces before he died. A pity. The 601st strike team moved further into the cave system and found two more sleeping insurgents, this time actually sleeping in bed rolls instead of on guard, and dispatched them quickly by two of the strike team stomping down with their heels onto the throats of the sleeping men. Despite shattering their throats, they held their heels there until the gurgling stopped, while the rest of the strike team watched down the caveway for any movement. Once the sleeping men were laid to eternal rest, the strike team moved further into the cave, finally finding the main chamber. They had been making sure to snuff out any candle or lantern they came across, keeping the darkness for themselves and letting their enemies not have the comfort of the light. Peeking out from the dim, they observed the main chamber and saw their target, the leader of this little schoolyard insurgency. Around him were about six fighters still armed, some of them listening in on radios, watching movies off of VSRs, or reading through Vogue magazines. The strike team of the 601st pushed in like a tidal wave of lead, weapons flashing and barking like hounds of lightning released to the hunt. Insurgents fell to the cave floor or died where they sat, except for one. For some reason, none of the bullets had struck the insurgent leader, somehow being just enough off course to avoid striking their target, which of course made no sense to the strike team leader, as his men were crack shots and they were only 20 yards away. While he dropped his magazine and grabbed another from his chest rig, he saw a flash of light and heard a scream. A fireball had whipped across the room and engulfed one of his troopers who screamed and danced in the writhing flame. Shouts and curses echoed in the cavern as some of the strike team tried to put him out, but it was like the flame could not be snuffed. Another fireball roared across the cavern and slammed into the trooper trying to extinguish his brother in arms with a nearby blanket. And now he too wailed in anguish as fire licked and ate at his flesh, burning it to black and char. The sergeant first class couldn't see what the hell was shooting the fucking fire. 
and could barely see their main target through the haze. But he had had enough of this shit. Pulling out his knife and a tomahawk gifted by an American ranger, he began to sprint towards the figure who seemed to be twirling in the heat haze and laughing. He had to duck as another fireball swirled through the air, singeing his back and sucking at the air in his lungs as it soared overhead and impacted another of his team. As he sprinted forward, he spared a fleeting glance over his shoulder as time seemed to crawl. He saw them, clawing at their faces as flames licked along their skin, rolling on the ground to try and get the flames off of them, screaming as they desperately tried to pull off their gear and crackling clothes. The fire seemed to be alive wrestling them and coiling around their bodies like a great worm of flame as they shrieked. He had no idea what kind of chemical could burn like that, but the secret would die here and now. Raw heat radiated off his mission target, burning him like he was ducking his head into a blazing bonfire, but he still lurched forward leaping with both of his feet to launch himself through the air. As he penetrated the haze, he saw the figure for the first time, what was truly burning his men alive. It had black eyes and skin like charcoal. I had never seen anything like it in all my days. It cackled at me, even as I buried that tomahawk right into its skull. It took a few good whacks, but it died, and the flames along with it. The sergeant first class paused for a moment before pouring some tea into his field cup and setting the small pot back onto the fire. It had elf ears, much like that one over there. He pointed towards Yethus, who was happily braiding a German man's long golden hair, but looked so alien, so evil. We killed it, though, and brought the body back along with the bodies of my men. The elf thing was quickly snatched up by some suits who were waiting for us after I reported what we were returning with, even diverted the bird from Shank to McLean, which made no sense to me. They snatched up the body, ordered us not to speak of it, and that was it. Soon after, we were disbanded the following year with no reason behind it, but I have an inkling. Yule stared at him for a long time, watching the memories play back in the man's eyes as he sipped his tea, along with the others who all seemed to bear the same loss and pain, not only of their fellow troopers, but an entire unit and brotherhood. Yule broke to silence, holding out his hand. I'm Yule. The sergeant first class stared at Yule's hand for a breath, before reaching out and taking it in his. Prusik. Yule nodded comfortingly before reaching his hand out to another check. Good to meet you guys. Now what's your name? Later that night, Yule sat back in his little office area inside the command bunker inside, resting his head back onto his rucksack. After dinner, the Veil vale Riders decided to officially indoctrinate the Europeans into the company, giving them the few precious extra patches they had in storage from their first trip in. Having made them official, Piper took Brita back into his command and made the checks autonomous, showing respect to their training and veterancy. What this meant for Coswell and Company was that now their total strength was at 109 or 110, depending on what native was doing what and how many harpies they had with them. This finally allowed for proper platoon grouping, and he had spent most of dinner appointing platoon sergeants and other such bookkeeping so things ran smoothly. The brush feathered had recovered as well, and the female was sticking to gruesome like glue, learning and inhaling all the knowledge that the marine was giving her. The little harpy had even learned how to wrap a bandage with her wings and how to use her claws to operate some of the finer details of a tourniquet in the field. The male was still willing to act as a scout as well, and wanted to be with the 601st troopers as their personal assistant. Yule was fine with that, and paid them both their gold so the contract would at least be fulfilled, despite it being a hollow assurance of the loss of their fellow harpies. 
Brita being folded back in with her fellow Germans alleviated the babysitting of her. And it appeared that many of the Europeans didn't harbor too many harsh feelings about the ambush. This was the trickiest evolution of combat any of the Cosling Company knew, and there was far more hate for the Fae than there was for each other at the current moment. Yule knew this couldn't last forever, and eventually that chicken would come home to roost. But for now, there was a common enemy that they would work against and keep things in line. Yule was tired, and deep in his soul, and looked to the side where Alavara once lay. He had to admit he was getting the feelings about the whole ordeal and ached to have her next to him again as he slept. And the letters he would send to her would usually just aggravate the pain even more when a response came. He quietly pondered what his long past wife would have said about this. Probably something akin to, she can do better, which made him sadly chuckle. He stared into the dim light for a bit longer as his mind churned before reaching over and twisting the lantern so the light died into pitch black. Three more days passed as Fawcett was sending almost daily letters to Yule, keeping him abreast of the production line that was being set up in the engineer hold. Additionally, the humans of Cosbling Company were mingling happily, which eased some of the stress off of Yule. On the fourth day, a flight from Savras came into the outpost, coming in from Emil Norris to bring ammunition and supplies. While the rest of the company were able to get fresh bottles of wine and ammo, Yule couldn't help but break out into a nervous sweat. Savras was in this flight, and she was holding a long package in her feet. He also saw she had a pistol strapped to a drop holster on one of her legs. It seemed Coco had completed the contract for him, despite hoping that the bird woman would simply forget. Chickaly was in there as well, and landed down in the middle of the Veil Riders with multiple bags tied to him. With a roar of glee, he pulled out two of the bottles, in which grain alcohol glittered. The roar was met in volume by the Veil Riders, who showered Chickaly with praise while unpacking the bottles from him. The harpy looked ragged from flying with the weight, but was in good spirits. The rest of the Himalayan harpies landed down, shaking themselves or stretching their long wings as other Veil Riders grabbed small crates of ammunition and took them to the depot. Then, with a whoosh of wings and air pressure, Savras landed before Yule, her merlot red eyes staring into his as a grin played across her fangs. Long time no see. She purred, and grabbed the long package from her feet up with her wing digits, resting it against her breasts and shoulder. Savaris, how good to see you again, Yule replied, trying to look anywhere but the harpy. Liar, she said flatly, but was still smiling all the same. Thought Savaris would not be back, hmm? One could only hope, Yule murmured and Savaris spread the smile to her dangerous eyes. Savaris has package for you, the harpy said, and struck the long thing in her wings while tilting her head to Yule. But it come with price. Here we fucking go, thought Yule, and he sighed, resting his hands on his hips. What, Savaris? Savaris here from little birdie, you finally took someone to your bed. Yule glared at her. Then both of them trailed their eyes to Chickaly. Chickaly was currently laughing and holding an open bottle of the grain alcohol he brought back, and then saw the two staring at him. His laugh quickly died in his throat, and he choked a bit, seeing Yule glaring at him from under the bill of his hat, while Savras winked. Chickaly raised a foot and quickly goose-stepped around the back end of the packed veil riders, getting himself out of view. All right, so I did. What does that have to do with you? Yule growled, and took his hands from his hips and now crossed them on his chest. Savras acted as if she was playing with the wrapping of the package, which Yule assumed was his rifle coming back from Fawcett, and played her face into a look of idle amusement. Savras have little birdies everywhere. Savras knows the she-elf is not attached to you yet, nor you to her. Savaris also knows that she gave you okay for field interactions. 
The harpies simpered at Yule. Savras just want chance to meet the great and mighty Yule in the duel between the blankets. Hot chance in hell, fairy feathers, Yule barked, and looked down at the slowly flustering Himalaya harpy queen. Savras was now angry and the feathers on her wings were slowly starting to rise, and her hair poofed slightly. Th th that's fine? Savras, just keep this package as payment for her long trip, she hissed, and her eyes flashed dangerously. That's fine. I got plenty of rifles. Don't want mine smelling like bird feet anyway, Yule stated flatly and didn't uncross his arms. His own anger was starting to slowly eat away at his ingrained bird of prey fear. His back, however, was becoming slick with sweat regardless. Chickily said this rifle was special to you. He heard short-legged Prince say so. Savarus was now starting to really fluff up in rage, seeing her plan fall apart in front of her eyes. Dime a dozen, Yule said, and spat at his feet. This was a lie, of course, but she didn't know that. Around the camp, everyone was staring. And the Himalayan harpies were just trying to look anywhere but their queen as they tried to hide their snorts of laughter. The pitched yelling began to grow between the two as Piper turned to Domino, who was watching the fight gleefully. Why are they fighting? Piper mused, as he heard Chickalee swallow a gulp of alcohol while hiding among the taller troopers. Bird Lady wants Yule in order to cement her power or something. Yule is afraid of danger birds. Domino replied, his voice thick with humor, and the two combatants' voices raised to a fever pitch. Piper just raised his eyebrows at this information and blinked a few times, before looking back over at the argument. Here, take gross Yule rifle, probably full of beard hair and stupidity. Savarus tossed the rifle on the ground, her hair is puffed up as her wings. She was almost dark red in the face and sweating from how pissed off she was. Anyone would kill to bet a harpy queen. I wouldn't want your children anyway. We'd probably fly upside down and eat rocks. Aye, sure. And they would get that from their mother. Yule bit back and stooped down to pick up the rifle still nestled in its travel wrappings. Savarus was so angry that tears were welling up in her eyes. She knew she was beautiful, as many had told her so and stories were written about her in some chronicles from her prowess in combat. She was so frustrated at the human that she was almost ready to cry from how rude and hard-headed he was being. Since it was a rare occurrence that she didn't get her way, and this meathead had done it to her twice. There was a break in the combat, as Yule dusted off his package, watching her with rage in his eyes. Seconds passed as the two stared at each other, with Savarus grinding her teeth. Savarus needs a few days to rest for trip back, she stammered, fighting back the indignant tears. Fine, stay out of the command bunker, Yule ordered grimly, and spun on his heel to take the rifle back inside, ducking down into the HQ. Savarus watched him go, shaking with fury before letting out a scream of annoyance that only a royal could possess, and stomping away from the command bunker. Everyone watched her angrily wipe at her face with her wings, and a few of her harpies ran after her. Domino let out a whistle. Man, he really does not like her. Some of the Himalayan harpies that were around them shrugged and took off their flying rigging. Gruesome had to be called over to translate for them, but he confirmed that Savarus wanted to try and use Yule to cage in more power to take over the other harpy clans. A pretty female harpy sat down on a log seat and stretched out her wings in her back, crackling her spine happily and whimpering in pleasure. Savarus thinks seducing Yule will also let her be able to use his men-at-arms for conquest. Eerie don't see why. She already controlled Biggest Harpy Clan as it is. Eerie thinks she just jealous of Chickaly. Piper, after hearing Gruesome translate the words from the little darling of a harpy, gave a wry hoomph. Rather shrewd of her to think it would be that easy. I've only known the man for a few days and even I can see the challenge of the task she has set herself. 
Gruesome turned to Eerie and translated, in which Eerie just gave tinkling laughter while wiggling her feet happily. Sitting on Gruesome's shoulders was the brush-feathered harpy female, who was resting her head on Gruesome's and looking bored with the whole thing. Salili thinks whole thing's stupid. Again, Gruesome translated, and everyone laughed at the real truth of what she said. It was all a bit silly to the humans, but it was just the way things seemed to be in this world. Through the rest of the day, everyone mingled with the Himalayas and shared their meals with them, as well as relishing in the supplies they brought with. They later learned in the evening that the Harpies were just a forward supply chain of a longer train of wagons coming in down the road. And indeed, the next morning, several long covered wagons arrived bearing additional building supplies, more ammunition, some of the dwarven mortar tubes that were fresh from the engineering hold, a few dwarven engineers, and fresh foodstuffs for the outpost to live off of. There were even a lot of volunteers that came up to help cook and take care of the place, and eventually Yule was worn down by them to let them stay. Unfortunately for Yule, Savarus also wormed her way into staying on the base, declaring that Yule had hurt her feelings and that she was owed recompense by being able to stay and do proper scouting for Cosbling Company. The first several times she tried, he said no. But by the fifth hour of her constantly screeching at Yule, he finally yelled back at her that he'll allow it but that she herself was banned from ever entering the command bunker during her stay. Feeling she had finally won one over Yule, she didn't stop acting smug for the entire week that the outpost was expanded. Mortar tubes were dug in deep, and the engineers showed the Veil Riders how to operate the Thoop tubes. While the volunteers of Valley Elves, Brim Touched, Oni, and Dwarves helped carve out a more livable space on the outposts, including building actual bunkhouses and dining quarters from the lumber surrounding the place. The Dwarves had really outdone themselves with the mortar tubes. The entire length of the barrels were done up with runes and the openings of the mortars carved into shapes of belching trolls or roaring Dwarven gods. Even the sights seemed extremely squared away, perfect mimicries of the actual mortar sights used on Terra, except these were enchanted and automatically adjusted for wind. They would even self-adjust by shouting dwarvish at them, in which the Veil Riders who had manned them had to take crash courses on rough dwarvish for phrases such as down 2 or left 20. With the outpost now looking like a fob now more than anything, Yule began drafting his plans for operations and sorties to harass and tarry any enemies that were nearby, and sent out some of the Himalayans to scout from above. He warned them not to get too close, and to stay as high and hidden as possible. With their feathers and markings being mostly white, he didn't want them anywhere near the ground or the dark green forest. He also sent word back for any volunteers who wanted to fight. With the dwarves here ready for war, and the chosen children drilling themselves into an army, he was going to need all the help he could get. It was time for Yule to break his taboo and give an elf a rifle. And that's the end of this chapter. And, this, and that's the end of this chapter. That's, this is the end of this chapter. There we go. That's how voices work. Good job, guard. If you enjoy this story and others like them, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel of Garbeardia. Additionally, stop by Neckbeardia for more fantasy story goodness. Um, I appreciate you guys keeping on listening to the story and reading along with me and waiting for the writing to get done. Um, I, I want to see, I would love to see more growth with the story, but I just have no idea how to like, where to post it or how to share it. I have no idea. So I actually do need your guys' help with that. But uh, yeah, thanks for sticking around. And uh, patches should be out of production in any of y'all's hands here soon, I'm hoping. I've halted most of the patch orders on the page in case those people order a rider patch. So that way you don't pay for shipping twice. So I'm kind of holding all orders on on the site for now until the patches come in yeah until i see you again on this side of the veil this has been guard bro